what we're observing is changes in life on the, uh, in, on the planet and how and why it's changing. So many of the things that we're doing revolve around that idea. Uh, the lab has grown pretty big. I have uh, probably about 15 to 17 people that are pretty regular, but we have had several visitors also. So it's, it's about seven students, and I have some students that are in other departments in Tampa, uh, and uh, four postdocs. So it's really five postdocs, one, one of them in Puerto Rico. So it's a pretty heavy load. Uh, it's a really great group, and everything that I do, I owe to this group. Uh, and if anything goes wrong, it's my fault. Okay. <laughs> so really, the, the mission that we have is really to understand the diversity and abundance of life in the ocean and how it's changing and why. So some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about is some of the projects that do that. One of the things that we manage here are two antennas. One of them is out here in the parking lot. These are these balls that you see. Uh, one of them is on top of the building. We've been operating these for over 20 years now. We collect real-time data from, the, from a, a few satellites that fly overhead. Uh, some are NASA, some are NOAA. And what we do with them is we try to measure the temperature and the color of the ocean in more or less real time. We process the data as soon as the satellite uh, comes over, collects the data, and we, we collect the data for the Caribbean Sea, Gulf of Mexico, and the east coast of the U.S. So that's more or less what we can see. We also have uh, a lot of projects that deal with larger regions, and we use data from NASA, NOAA, and other groups that collect satellite data to look at, for example, uh, global patterns in temperature, global patterns in uh, chlorophyll concentration. Oops. So what... Uh So one of the examples of what we can do with these data is very simple things. Uh, if you take the Gulf of Mexico and divide it in, into whatever regions, it can be squares or any, and you can analyze any type of data. In this case, I even overlaid um, oil rigs, a, a study I'm not going to talk about, but we, we looked at how temperature in the Gulf of Mexico or color of the, of the waters around rigs may change over time as you put in more rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. In this case, what I tried to look at is in these four quadrants of the Gulf of Mexico, whether temperature and chlorophyll have changed over time since we have nearly 30 years of satellite data at the moment. So there, there is, in fact, a little bit of a warming trend in the Gulf of Mexico of about half a degree every 10 years. Now, if you look at chlorophyll concentration, which we have maybe 15 some years, uh, there's no change. And it just goes up and, up and down a little bit. What you're seeing here are anomalies in time. So the anomalies in chlorophyll don't change, and yet there's a very clear trend in temperature. So the question is why. You usually would think that if something, a, a part of the ocean is warming, that it would become more stable and that you would maybe decrease the chlorophyll concentration or the productivity. So uh, I looked at some models and looked at uh, mixed layer depth as it's been modeled, uh, looked at wind, wind speed. You can measure wind speed from satellites as well. So there's long records for many of these variables. You can try to put together a story. So the story, the conclusions that I got at least were very simple, that for the 30 years that I looked at, uh, for part of that when I had a chlorophyll record, even though temperature and wind speed were increasing, the mixed layer depth was not increasing. And so to me, what that means is that more or less those two effects counteract each other, and it ends up uh, not affecting biology. So the the, 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 at least the chlorophyll concentration in the Gulf of Mexico has been pretty stable over this period. Uh, the, the other project that we started is this Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. That's a very large uh, program. We're trying to now uh, expand that internationally with the help of NOAA and NASA and the GEO group, the group of Earth Observation. So there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy trying to get that done. We're trying to do a pole-to-pole project uh, in terms of several transects and looking at biodiversity. So we're, we're starting here. We have uh, four, effectively three projects with four major sites in the U.S. These are, again, funded by NOAA and NASA. There's a component funded by uh, BOEM and Shell. And these groups are uh, here in uh, USF. We lead one that includes uh, Maya, uh, the people at, um, at FWRI, and then there's 10 other institutions, pretty large group. In Alaska, Katrin Eichen is uh, managing one on the Chukchi Sea, 
and um, uh, Bob Miller is uh, at Santa Barbara in Santa Barbara Basin. So the idea here is uh, to look at something that uh, that really what, there are two real cores to this. Uh, one is to try to develop a set of technologies that we call environmental DNA, eDNA is kind of the rage out there right now where we take a parcel of water and you develop uh, the primers and all the analysis to, to understand what was in contact with that parcel of water over the life of the, that, that you can think of as the DNA, 24 hours or 48 hours. So if there was a fish or a whale or a bacteria uh, or phytoplankton in contact with that water mass, you would be able to separate it and say, well, there was a, it's kind of a presence absence thing. Eventually, there's some hope that you can say something about concentration. But that's a, a big part, and the other part is a satellite component. We're trying to come to come up with uh, what we're calling seascapes. So it's more, more or less a dynamic uh, rep representation of what conditions in the ocean are more or less constant between one period and, no and another, and you can call it a, a, a specific class or uh, seascape or biogeographic area. So these are not new concepts. What we're trying to do is op make this operational in, in a real-time fashion. So one of our clients, quote unquote, the user, are the marine sanctuaries. The National Marine Sanctuaries Program is a, is a program that is in, interested in our data to update their, what they call the condition reports. And so we would like to then uh, see something like this used for other marine protected areas around the world. Now, if you have a bunch of students and postdocs, and you, they look like that, they're not, they don't want to get in the water, they don't want to sample, they're, you know, what do you do? So one of the things that we offer is travel. You know, you can go to faraway places like Key West. You can say, well, you, some people may think that you can see Cuba from here. So we teach an ocean policy course, so that, that counts for credit. If you're close enough, you could even be president. You know. uh, music. We offer people ice cream, so we plant samples at the bottom of the ocean where you can go pick up your samples of ice cream, and then they get happy. So then they generate data, and lots of data. <laughs> uh, they analyze the data. In this case, we have generated maps using satellite data of coral reefs. Uh, Maria uh, Vega Rodriguez here is also involved with NOAA in generating uh, relatively high resolution uh, map of, of temperature that ha allows you to see what the stress uh, factor is for coral reefs. And, and, and in a sense, you accumulate the number of days that a coral reef would be exposed to a, a number of hot days. And uh, that, uh, that is an improvement from what NOAA has done because they've done that at a very large scale, at a very coarse resolution. Uh, we also get underwater. We try to collect uh, observations of the color of the water and the color of the bottom of the water to try to understand how that changes over time. And for example, Gerardo Toro and some of the students uh, have looked at this, trying to understand if you have a cloud or a storm fly uh, passing over, uh, and Maria measured the color of a coral. In fact, the corals react almost instantly to the passage of, of storms, and they kind of shut down their, the photosynthesis that you can measure inside a coral. So it's very, very interesting. You do that with these kinds of devices that you, attach, you, you put up against a coral. So we measure calcification and um, produ production inside the coral and see how th that changes with time or the conditions of the water column. Uh, uh, Dan Otis and Matt McCarthy and some other people in the lab are looking at how land use over the past 30 to 40 years around the Gulf of Mexico uh, has changed and how that affects water quality that uh, EPA has measured in some of these estuaries. And so we try to pair that up with satellite data that we have for the past uh, 15 years or so. One of the things that we're also doing is we have uh, an agreement with uh, Digital Globe. Digital Globe launches very, very high resolution satellite data. And so they're giving us literally thousands of images at, at very high spatial resolution between half a meter uh, per pixel to uh, a meter. And so we're starting map some of the uh, wetlands around some of these estuaries, and we are doing that from here to Fiji, uh, where we are going, trying to take old maps like these. These are the present, uh, what they call uh, coastal change analysis program, or land use change maps, where they map wet, wet, wetlands at 30 meter resolution. And this is what we get with the products that we're 
trying to come up right now. So it's a, it's a really big step in how we map wetlands around the bay. And you see very different things at this resolution. Uh, Laura Lorenzoni is leading an effort with the uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and trying to put together or link uh, bio uh, geochemical time series around the world. These, uh, there's a number of time series that, uh, that uh, collect everything from zooplankton to nutrient data to chlorophyll data. And so she's organizing a group that not only tries to look at these and see how they compare, how the patterns that you see in these time series compare to satellite data, but also how you connect the different time series program together for training purposes. So she organized, a, uh, this is already the second one, she organized a, a course in Bermuda and another one in Norway where she uh, gets all these people together, basically technicians, and, and as opposed to just having scientists talk to each other. So these are students and technicians comparing methods on time series. Uh, another program that we've been maintaining for over 20 years now, this is a, a program supported by the National Science Foundation and the government of Venezuela, is the Cariaco Time Series. Lots of people involved in there. I can't do justice to the number of people that have been involved in this program over the years. It's, uh, it's a program that looks at, at the Cariaco Basin in the Southern Caribbean Sea, where there's very strong seasonal changes, but there is also uh, because it's, a, it's an anoxic basin, it records climate change in the sediments in a, in a way that a lot of people have used over the years to even calibrate the chronology of other uh, paleoclimate records. So what we do is we have been going down there for almost 20 years. We have monthly to more than once a month cru cruises. And we try to understand what is it, how do these particles form or change that fall to the bottom of the ocean by looking at what? Uh, variability we see near the surface. So uh, the, the, the program is we're up for renewal next year, so that's a big challenge after having 20 some years of funding to request another three to five years of funding. So NSF views this as, an, as a facility. So one of the core objectives is to maintain the facility and provide the data to the community. So everything, all the data that we collect is open as soon as we process it and we quality control it, it's open to the public. Uh, but the other thing is we really try to have a, 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 a training facility here and we, we try to see how we can make people work even if they, they're used to not working. So <laughs> some of these people, you know, it takes a lot of work to get some of these time series going. And so there's one person here, Enrique Montes, who is always dreaming and he's actually one of my right-hand people in the lab. So he's, I, I, I'm not doing him justice here. He's really a wonderful individual, extremely productive, but he just uh, has to take a rest occasionally. <laughs> so the scientific goals of the Cariaco Basin program are really understanding the linkages between the oceanographic processes, especially that we see near the surface, and whatever happens at the bottom of the basin. So. With that, we hope to explain uh, or provide a way to explain the, the variability that you see at the bottom in the sediment cores. So in 20 years, obviously, we're not seeing true climate change. We're seeing just what happened in the past 20 years. And uh, the, what we've seen in the Caribbean is also the, that the surface of the Caribbean has been warming. And that, that's a pretty strong signal. It's about a degree in the last 20 years, similar to what the middle of the Gulf of Mexico is. It's not surprising that two basins are connected. Uh, so uh, the other thing that we're seeing is there are, there are chemical changes. So pH is, uh, is, is in fact decreasing, the, uh, it is, and it's measurable. So even in an upwelling, this is a very strong upwelling area where you have a lot of mixing, the trade winds are very strong, and even there you see the signal of, uh, of the decrease in pH. All of, all of this is also superimposed on changes in biology that we've seen over the past 20 years. About, about in the order of uh, the year 2000, there was a big step change in the com plankton community in the Cariaco Basin where we, we have seen the productivity of the basin decrease. The phytoplankton concentration has decreased. The type of phytoplankton has changed from initially large cells to much smaller cells in the last 10 years or so. And at the same time, zooplankton biomass has inc increased uh, more or less uh, 
uh, regularly. So it, it, it is not clear to us why this happened. There's been a, a lot of pressure on fishing of the sardine in the Southern Caribbean and the fisheries collapsed in, in the year 2000 or so. So all these changes are, are related. It's not just uh, changes in, in, in the climate of the Caribbean, but it's also the fishing pressure and we have to try to sort that out. Uh, we are involved in other projects and these are international projects funded by NSF in our case and by uh, the UK and Brazil and other in, in, in the other parts of the team. It's funded under this uh, construct called the Belmont Forum and Future Earth. These are big uh, things that are happening internationally. And our project is called Metropole. So what, what we're doing here is we're trying to educate ourselves on some of the human dimensions on, on how uh, communities make decisions if you inform them about a, a change in the environment that is caused by some light, large scale factor like climate change uh, or you have sea level. How would a community react? So we're working with three communities, one basically in each one of these countries and trying to understand their values and uh, how they make decisions, uh, how they uh, interact with each other if you provide them with the same type of scientific information. And we're finding that it, it's clear. Some, some of the communities are gonna react very, very differently, but just culturally between these countries, there's very different ways of handling uh, property data and, and it, why a lot of this data is very open, openly available in the U.S. In Brazil, it's, they're scared to death to share any information because you may end up with people speculating on prices of property, for example. So it's very difficult to, uh, to break through through some of these communities. But anyway, this is led by C.J. Reynolds and she has a group of students working with her in our lab. Uh, CJ is also very clever in trying to uh, come up with messages on how you communicate with the public. So one of the things that she is, was involved in, is involved in, is uh, uh, she got some funding from NOAA to educate people and work with the city uh, on how to control the debris that flows into the ocean from, uh, through creeks and freshwater systems. So she uh, she's runs around town working with the city and trying to track where trash goes. And one of the things that came out of this project is the development of a large scale sculpture. The sculpture was in front of the, this, this thing that you're seeing there was in front of the uh, USF library. Uh, it went to Atlanta, then it went to Michigan. Now we're trying to bring it back. But this thing was put together by, uh, by some artists from Georgia. Uh, they designed it. Uh, we, we did it through this grant and they put children to, get, to collect trash, plastics, and they melted the plastic onto a, a chicken wire mesh that get, got wrapped around the sculpture to provide some sense of, sense of a swirl that you can imagine. If you get into the middle of the swirl and you look up, you see fish and you see fish swimming among trash. Uh, so one of the things that we uh, were trying to to educate our students uh, with is, are these concepts. Uh, so there's a lot of linkages between what we do and, and how uh, you end up with a better place to live, how the ocean can be a better place with the work that we do. So the, the messages are that uh, biodiversity is very important and biodiversity is not the same everywhere. It changes with time and it's very hard to measure. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it there if there's any questions. Well, it's the past 20 to 30 years, yeah. I think that any, any data set that you look at uh, shows more or less the same. And it, these are surface values, so it's, uh, it's right at the surface. But I think that uh, it, it's pretty clear that in our area anyway, temperature, at least for this period, is changing, whether it's part of a cycle, like uh, there's a cycle over the Atlantic that, has, that tends to show some periodicity, and that we are in that 
uh, kind of upswing of this uh, Atlantic Meridional oscillation. So it may be that, or it may be a longer term trend. We don't know yet, but uh, the, the, the whole North Atlantic is showing this type of thing. The, How does the uh, pH changes over the Carriaco Basin time series compare to measurements made elsewhere of pH changes in the oceans? Well, we've, we've, there are very few long-term pH uh, measurements like that in an area. Uh, for, we, there are measurements at the Bermuda Atlantic time series in Hawaii. Uh, there's a couple other time series, and they basically all show the same thing. So there, there's a... Uh, there's a decrease in pH that if you convert it to, uh, to carbon, is very much similar. It, it follows the trend of the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. So it, it's, uh, there's no surprise there. Okay, so, uh, but the interesting thing is that it, this is an upwelling area, and you see it even in the upwelling area. Now, uh, we've been trying to see if the signal in the Cariaco Basin is imported uh, the upwelling water is what we call subtropical underwater. That comes, it forms in the North Atlantic, sort of off of Africa. It sinks and it takes, uh, you know, six to nine months maybe to get to area, maybe even longer. So I, I don't know, it, it may be an imported signal, so, but it, it, the fact is that we see a signal uh, that is in tune with what other time series are seeing. So this is an, an example of ocean acidification, real ocean acidification as opposed to Operation. Okay. I was interested in your long-term phytoplankton, zooplankton trends. Um, in biomass, phytoplankton went down fairly linear. Well, like you should, it was a linear trend, and then it's somewhat linear on the increasing. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a cartoon. There, there are steps. So the the phytoplankton cell size was a step. Yeah, yeah. The, that, that's yeah. what I'm really interested right. in. How much of a step that was? It's a big step. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know you said you don't, you guys don't really exactly know what's going on, but can you speculate a little bit? Well, I, I mean, we know that the Caribbean warmed up. The trade winds decreased during this period, especially we had very, very strong trade winds when we started Cariaco in the late 90s, uh, and then in the early 2000s and, and and through most of the 2000s, the trade winds in this part of the Caribbean were quite a bit lower, and so upwelling decreased. So we know that upwelling uh, strength uh, decreased relative to when we started. Uh, now, it may be that the norm is the, the reduced upwelling, and we just started during a period when the trade winds 